Hello and welcome to this companion series to AK Warder's Grammar Guide, an introduction to Parley. Today we come to lesson 16, and in this lesson we cover three sizable subjects. The locative case, future passive participles, and camadaria compounds. And there's a menu down in the description below, so you can jump between the sections and even rewatch if you wish. So let's get started. This is Parley Studies on the Learn Parley channel. Camadaria, camadaria. Why do I have a problem saying that? So we begin lesson 16 with the locative case, and we're going to look at both how to recognize it and how it's used. The locative noun, as the name suggests, indicates location. Either the place where, the time when, or the circumstance within which the action took place. And generally, we can represent this with the English prepositions in, on, or at. So, an a stem noun in Pali, in the masculine and neuter, takes the inflection e, and this is the same as the accusative plural. So the locative noun and the accusative plural actually look the same. And there are a couple of alternatives, asming and amhi in the singular. Feminine stems ending in a long a have that aya ending and also ayang in the singular. And in the plural we have esu and asu respectively. This is now a complete declension table for a stem nouns. So, let's now look at how the locative noun is used. You probably won't be surprised to find that the locative noun indicates location, either the place, time, or circumstance in which an action takes place. And in the plural, the locative noun can overlap a bit with the partitive genitive, when it has the sense of among, as in the Blessed One lives among the Sakyans. Now, as well as simple location, it can take a more figurative meaning, that of reference, meaning with respect to or regarding. So we get not knowledge in phenomena, but knowledge with respect to phenomena, or regarding phenomena, and doubt with respect to the doctrine, or regarding the doctrine. Actually, the sense in which the locative case can be used is actually quite broad, and Warder gives us several other examples. Most of these can be rendered by the English words in, or regarding, as we've just seen. But it's worth highlighting, I think, that also, like the genitive, the locative case is often used in an absolute construction, or the locative absolute. This shouldn't be confused with the absolutive verb inflection. The absolute construction is when a participle and its subject noun are in the same case, and this is most often locative. But that subject noun is different from the subject of the finite verb in the main sentence. So here, picante is the past participle meaning left, and both it and its subject, sariputa, are in the locative singular, whereas the brahmin is the subject of the main verb. So this can be seen as being similar to the locative of circumstance, in that the absolute clause provides context or circumstance for the sentence as a whole, but without the usual locative meaning of in or at. Instead, it implies while, when, or after. The situation of the absolute clause either occurring simultaneously with the action of the main clause or just before it. So if we take another example, here, agachante is a present participle agreeing with its subject, surye, in gender, case and number. The sun rises. While the main verb has an implied plural subject, 
they. So we get, as the sun rises, they enter the forest. OK. Moving on to the future passive participle. Although less frequent, this verbal adjective has many of the characteristics of the past participle, being used mainly in passive voice sentences. There's no true equivalent to the future passive participle in English. The closest translation is a passive to infinitive, such as to be done, to be asked, to be spoken. And although called future passive participles, rather than simple future, they imply a sense of potential mixed with obligation. This is to be done, this should be done, or this must be done. So sometimes they're also termed potential participles, and often gerundives as they correspond to gerundives in Latin. And neither is it formed on the future verb stem. So, turning now to look at its formation, the future passive participle can be formed either on the present stem or on a strengthened form of the verbal root. It's characterised by the affixes taba, ania, or just ya, and we'll now look at each of these in turn. Present stems have taba added by means of a connecting i vowel and most verbal roots ending in an u, either short u or long u, form the future passive participle on the present stem. To the remaining roots, taba is added directly if they end in a vowel, and roots ending in either a short or a long e strengthen these vowels to e. A few roots ending in u are strengthened to o. When the root ends in a consonant, taba may be added by means of that connecting i vowel, or if added directly, the initial t of taba assimilates with the final consonant. So if we look at this quickly, the assimilation usually results in a double t, g, or d. And I should add that this is a bit simplified, as there are quite a few peculiarities due to Sanskrit. Now, taba is the most common affix. But ania is also often found. This, I think, is only applied to verbal roots, but the affixes are also applied to the causative verbal base, and this can appear like a present stem. So, to the root, it's added directly. Sometimes when added to roots ending in an r, the n of ania becomes retroflex, and some roots also undergo vowel strengthening. Likewise with the affix ya, although I think there is a form that's derived from bava on the present stem, this affix is generally applied directly to roots. If the root ends in a long a, or a short or a long i, the vowel is changed to an e, and the y of the suffix ya is doubled. When the root ends in a consonant, most often the ya is added directly, and the y sound is then assimilated, as we've seen with other forms of the affix ya. And I'll just flash these up briefly now. Sometimes metathesis occurs. That's when the y and the final consonant change places. And in a few cases, the affix is joined with a connecting i, in which case a preceding a sound may be lengthened. So the result of all this is a wide range of alternative forms. The root ka to do even has a form with, I think, a t sound inserted, resulting in kitcha. And I should stress, I am simplifying a lot here. The point is really to be able to recognise these forms rather than to be able to derive them. And these then all decline, like a-stem nouns, to agree with their subject, like a participle. 
Let's move on now and look at how the future passive participle is used. Like the past participle, the future passive participle can be used as a finite verb, usually in a passive or impersonal manner, where any agent, if expressed, is in the instrumental case. The question is to be asked by the Brahmin. Apparently, it can be used in an active sense with intransitive verbs of motion, but unfortunately, I can't find any examples. Now, also like past participles, a future passive participle can be used periphrastically with an auxiliary verb to express the tense, in which case they tend to imply the perfective verbal aspect. So we can form the question had to be asked, the question has to be asked, or the question will have to be asked. Thus, by using different forms of the verb to be, we can produce different tenses. And if you need a refresher on verbal tense and aspect, see the videos appearing above. And as well as obligation, the future passive participle can express a wide range of meanings from capable of, prone to, or fit for. And in the neuter, it can also be used as a noun. So, karaniya literally means to be done, or capable of being done. And in the neuter, it can be used as a noun, meaning one's duty. Literally, that which ought to be done. And similarly, bojaniya means to be eaten, capable of being eaten, or fit for eating. But when used in the neuter, it can simply mean food. So we can see that the future passive participle, like the past participle, can be used either as a finite verb, an adjective, or even a noun. And although all of the forms do get used in all of these ways, the affix taba is more often used as a finite verb, and ania as an adjective. Right, let's move on. So next we return to compound words in Pali. And we're going to be looking at the Kamadareya compound. A Kamadareya is formed when one member of the compound is an attribute to the other. Meaning that it qualifies or describes the other member. Like an adjective or two nouns in apposition. So these are sometimes called adjectival compounds. The difference to a taparissa is that if the member terms were not compounded, the two words would be in the same case, because one qualifies the other, rather than having a case relationship between them. One could usefully think of the members as having a nominative case relationship, following the formula a B that is A, speech that is wrong, a boat that is a house. Some guides even have these as a subclass of the taparissa, and both are called determinate compounds. Now, a camadarea always has two members, and can take one of four forms. The most characteristic being where there is a leading adjective qualifying a substantive noun. But we can also find an adjective or an adverb which qualifies another adjective, and this is often a verbal adjective such as a participle, for example, softly spoken. A substantive may adverbally qualify an adjective, such as cold as ice, or two substantives can come together either in apposition or in a simile, a boat that is like a house. So hopefully you get the idea. Now let's look at some examples in Pali. An adjective qualifying a substantive is the most common. And the adjective can equally be a verbal adjective, such as a participle. Like the English terms blackbird and greenhouse, 
the combination can imply more than just the sum of the parts. So here, black snake is not just a snake which happens to be black, but is a particular variety of snake. Double adjectives are also quite common, and this group includes adverbs, especially with participles. So we have rightly freed or right release and wrong speech. Also, an adjective may follow a substantive. This may be merely a reversal of the normal order, but more properly, it's when the substantive adverbially qualifies the adjective, and so we have to insert an as between the two terms. Dear as life, smooth as a shell. And a camadaria may consist of two substantives that are either in apposition, that's where they both describe or refer to the same object, the king sage, and you may often find names and titles combined in this manner, or the substantives may express a simile or comparison, which follow the formula a bee like a. A bull like sage, a moon like face, star like eyes, and unlike English, here the comparative term comes last. In English, we're much more likely to say moon face or star eyed, and sometimes members of this group are rendered as taparissas. For instance, wealth like morality may be better rendered as wealth of morality. And sword-like wisdom, the sword of wisdom. Anyway, with the exception of this last group, which can be a bit counterintuitive, the meaning of the camadaria is usually quite self-evident. And so we come to the final brief section that Warder entitles abbreviation. Here, the particle pe, pa, or la. Are all abbreviations of peala, which simply means ditto or etc. Because the canonical texts are highly repetitive, when there are only minor changes between one passage and the next, pe is used to indicate that a passage has to be repeated, but with the following words substituted. And this is the same as we use the ditto in English. This was probably a signal to the person reciting the text out loud to fill in the missing parts themselves. Well, that was lesson sixteen, and congratulations for making it this far. Lesson sixteen of Warder's Guide is seen as being the point where we've covered the majority of the groundwork. So well done, everybody. And don't forget to have a go at exercise sixteen. There are still answers available on the Wisdom and Wonders web page to exercise fifteen, and a link to this is down in the description below. And in next week's lesson, we'll review the declension patterns that we've seen so far, and also look at numbers. In the meantime, enjoy some more tutorials.